Hello to chapter 32 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville, and this chapter is titled Cetology. Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unsured harbourless immensities, ere that come to pass, ere the peacock's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the leviathan. At the outset, it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough, appreciative understanding of the more special leviathanic revelations and allusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you. Yet it is no easy task, the classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, says Captain Scoresby, A.D. 1820. It is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, the sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, A.D. 1839. Unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea, a field strewn with thorns. All these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale, the great Cuvier, and John Hunter, and Lesson, those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, though of real knowledge there be little, yet of books there are plenty, and so in some small degree with cetology or the science of whales. Many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or in little written of the whale. Run over a few. The authors of the Bible. Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gessner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rondelitius, Willoughby, Green, Artidi, Sibald, Brisson, Martin, Lassipidi, Bonterre, Desmarest, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin. Olmsted and the Reverend T. Cheever, but to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales, and but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman. I mean, Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said that the Greenland whale is an usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales, yet, owing to the long priority of his claims and the profound ignorance, which till some seventy years back invested the then fabulous and utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns, in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports, this usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the le leviathanic allusions in the great poets of the past days will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has last come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross, hear ye. 
good people all. The Greenland whale is deposed. The green, the great sperm whale, now reigneth. There are only two books on being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you and at the same time in the remotest degree succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beals and Bennets, both in their time surgeons to the English South Sea whale ships and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessary small, necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Now, the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline, one for the pre present hereafter to be filled in all outward its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or in this space at least too much of any description. My object here is simply to, to project the draught of a systemization of cetology. I am the architect not the builder. But it is a ponderous task, no ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it, to grope down into the bottom of the sea after them to have one's hand among the unspeakable foundations, ribs and very pelvis of the world. This is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold, the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales, with these visible hands. I am in earnest and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cetology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In this system of nature, no, in his system of nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus' express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows. On account of their warm, bellocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, pe panem intratem, feminum mamis lactantem, and finally ex lege naturae jure meritoc. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled. The next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items. But in brief, they are these, lungs and warm blood, whereas all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. 
Next, how shall we define the whale by his obvious externals as so as conspicuously to label him for all time to come to be short? Then a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However contracted that definition is the result of expanded meditation, a walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish because he is amphibious. But the last term of the definition is still more con cogent as coupled with the first. Almost anyone must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat but a vertical or up and down tail. Whereas among spouting fish the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of that, of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor on the other hand link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien. Hence, all the smaller spouting and horizontal tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. Now then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. First, according to magnitude, I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all but small, both small and large. Number one, the folio whale. Number two, the octa octavo whale. Number three, the duodecimo whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale of the octavo, the grampus of the duodecimo, the purpus, the purpus, folios. Among these, I here include the following chapters. Number one, the sperm whale. Number two, the right whale. Number three, the finback whale. Number four, the humpbacked whale. Number five, the razorback whale. Number six, the sulfur bottom whale. Book one, folio. Chapter one, sperm whale. This whale among the English of old, vaguely known as the trompa whale and the Fusetter whale and the anvil-headed whale is the present cachalot of the French and the potsfish of the Germans and the macrocephalus of the long words. He is without doubt the largest inhabitant of the globe, the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect and lastly by far the most valuable in commerce he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. Philologically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown in his own proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the whale. No, with the one... Sorry, I skipped the line to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea also that this same spermaceti was that quickening humor of the Greenland whale which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. In those times also spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the druggists, as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb, when, 
As I opine, in the course of time the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity. And so the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 2, Right Whale. In one respect, this is the most venerable of the Leviathans, being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article commonly known as whalebone or baleen, and the oil specially known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen, he is indiscriminately designed by all the following titles. The whale, the Greenland whale, the black whale, the great whale, the true whale, the right whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species thus multitudinously baptized. What then is the whale which I include in the second species of my folios? It is the great mysticetus of the English naturalists, the Greenland whale of the English whalemen, the baleen ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Growlands whalefish of the Swedes. It is the whale which for more than two centuries past has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas. It is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean, on the Brazilian banks, on the Norwest coast and various other parts of the world designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans, but they precisely agree in all their grand features. Nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale will be elsewhere treated of at some length with reference to eludicating the sperm whale. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 3, Finback. Under this head I reckon a monster which, by the various names of Finback, Tall Spout and Long John, has been seen almost in every sea and is commonly the whale whose distant jet is so often descried by passengers crossing the Atlantic in the New York packet tracks. In the length he attains and his baleen, the finback, resembles the right whale, but is of a less portly girth and a lighter colour approaching to olive. His great lips present a cable-like aspect formed by the intertwisting, slanting folds of large wrinkles. His grand distinguishing feature, the fin, from which he derives his name, is often a conspicuous object. This fin is some three or four feet long, growing vertically from the hinder part of the back of an angular shape and with a very sharp pointed end. Even if not the slightest other part of the creature be visible, this isolated fin will at times be seen plainly projecting from the surface. When the sea is moderately calm and slightly marked with spherical ripples, and this gnomon-like fin stands up and casts shadows upon the wrinkled surface, it may well be supposed that the watery circle surrounding it somewhat resembles a dial, with its style and wavy hour lines graved on it. On that Ahaz dial the shadow often goes back. 
The finback is not gregarious. He seems a whale-hater, as some men are man-haters. Very shy, always going, solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters, his straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall, misanthropic spear upon a barren plain. Gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming as to defy all present pursuit from man, this leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable Cain of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. From having the baleen in his mouth, the finback is sometimes included with the right whale, among a theoretic species denominated whalebone whales, that is, whales with baleen. Of these so-called whalebone whales, there would seem to be several varieties, most of which, however, are little known. Broad-nosed whales and beaked whales, pike-headed whales, Bunched whales, underjawed whales and rostrated whales are the fishermen's names for a few sorts. In connection with this appellative of whalebone whales, it is of great importance to mention that, however, such a nomenclature may be convenient in facilitating allusions to some kind of whales, yet it is in vain to attempt the clear classification of the Leviathan. Founded upon either his baleen or hump or fin or teeth, notwithstanding that Those marked parts or features very obviously seem better adapted to afford the basis for a regular system of cetology than any other detached bodily distinctions which the whale in his kinds presents. How then the baleen, humpback fin and teeth These are things whose peculiarities are indiscriminately dispersed among all sorts of whales without any regard to what may be the nature of their structure in other and more essential particulars. Thus, the sperm whale and the hump-backed whale each has a hump, but there the simil similitude ceases. Then this same hump-backed whale and the Greenland whale, each of these has baleen. But there again the simil similitude deceases and not deceases. But there again the similitude ceases. And it is just the same with the other parts above mentioned. In various sorts of whales, they form such irregular combinations or, in the case of any one of them, detached such er, an irregular isolation as utterly to defy all general methodization formed upon such a basis, on this rock every one of the whale naturalists has split. But it may possibly be conceived that in the internal parts of the whale, in his anatomy, anatomy there at least we shall be able to hit the right classification. Nay, What thing, for example, is there in the Greenland whale's anatomy more striking than his baleen? Yet we have seen that by his baleen it is impossible correctly to classify the Greenland whale. And if you descend into the bowels of the various leviathans, why there you will not find distinctions of 50th part as available to the systematizer as those external ones already enumerated. What then remains? Nothing but to take hold of the whale's body, bodily, in their entire liberal volume, and boldly sort them that way. And this is the biographical system here adopted, and it is the only one that can possibly succeed, for it alone is practicable to proceed. So, I think... I'll stop here today. Uh, bye bye. Till next time with the next part of this chapter.